I guess so. It's, They're not playing around. Yeah, it's it's rare to see um, actual film of a, a child like that, though. Almost a hundred years. Ago. Well, he'd be a hundred and two if he was alive today. Well, um, ninety. Oh, ninety, right? right. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, he'd definitely be up there. Right. It's scary, scary stuff, but. Okay, so uh, Lindbergh kidnapping, it's all wrapped up, right? They arrested the guy, we can move on? Yeah, I, I mean, you look at the evidence against him, but just to back up as to who Lindbergh was, because not, not everybody really knows who Charles Lindbergh was. Charles Lindbergh was a combination of Neil Armstrong, LeBron James, Muhammad Ali, and, 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 and Jimi Hendrix combined into one person who was the most famous celebrity in the world. And when he flew uh, the Spirit of St. Louis from Roosevelt Field, Long Island, which became a shopping mall, Roosevelt Field shopping mall that we used to go to when we cut school, uh, that's the air uh, strip that he took off from. He yeah, look sailed. at this plane. That's how rickety this shit is. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 look at that. Right. He's going over the whole Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> look how he's bouncing to take off I there. Know. Yeah, and he <laughs> finally gets like... airborne. I mean, Jesus Christ. So he, he flies across the Atlantic, of course, as they always point out, nonstop. Like, <laughs> where is he going to stop? This is Paris, obviously. When he lands, they go berserk. And it's kind of like the guys who landed on the moon. But even that mm -hmm. doesn't encapsulate it so much, right? Yeah, because there was it's more like the moon landing. Them. Yeah, I mean, just as an event, Eric. Yeah, this is just staggering. Um, we don't have anything comparable really no, to the no. level of um dare etc i mean well they didn't even know if the plane would get off the ground right <laughs> oh, yeah yeah so he this guy marries a beautiful woman named ann morrow and he teaches her how to fly and she becomes one of the leading women aviators in the world um and they fly around the world together it's the greatest romance of all time these two like look how beautiful she is Comes from a lot of money uh, from New Jersey. Uh, that's uh, the cover of her memoir, I think. Um, but she marries him, and they have this whirlwind courtship. There she is in a, uh, I guess that's a real fur, <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to today, ladies. Yeah. Um, yeah, there she is in her, her flight gear. Uh, she became quite a pilot herself, uh, you know, her and the other, the one who got lost, um, are the two most famous uh, women pilots. And they were apparently nemesis, from what I remember. They were rivals. Um, anyway, so they get married and they have a place in New Jersey, her parents' place, but they're building their own place. They have a baby um, and the baby is Charlie Jr., this, the one you were showing, that baby, um, they end up building a house in uh, northern New Jersey. And yeah, there's the kid right there. So they build this house in northern New Jersey, and it wasn't really finished yet. They would show up on the weekends uh, to stay with, um, to stay in the house, and they hadn't moved in yet. Uh, yeah, look at the size of that estate. I mean, it's a massive amount of property. I think it was like 600 acres or something. Um, yeah, I forgot how many rooms. Um, yeah, it was quite, quite palatial. Um, but there is one room in the second floor in the upper left hand corner, which was the baby room. Now, the baby room is where they put the baby to go to sleep. But normally they were only there on the weekends and the baby had a cold. Nobody knew this. So, I mean, there's a lot of weird. There's a, it's a lot of dots in today's show, ladies and gentlemen. I'll tell you that right now. And I don't have all the answers and nobody does. So there's a lot of stuff I'm going to put out here today that are dots that are not connected. If you feel you can connect them, God bless you. But a lot of people, this is still, even to this day, there's a lot of mysterious things, right, Eric? Yeah. It's, it, it was so controversial that even at the time you had a governor kind of saying, come on, man, help us out here. No, so we'll every time. I mean, look, that's why we don't have cameras in the courtroom anymore is because of this circus that occurred in this trial 
because it was so close to New York that everybody came over from the city. They're packed into this, which we'll get to in a minute. But just to go back to the crime, the baby is up in its baby crib and they have like a, a nurse and they have a butler and they have a housekeeper. And mm -hmm. the couple is downstairs. Everyone is awake. They have a yappy dog, a terrier yappy dog named Wagoosh that always barks. And somehow, at like 9.30 at night, on a Tuesday night, all of a sudden, the baby disappears. The nurse comes in there at 10. I think her name was Gao. Um, she comes in there and sees no baby, Betty Gao. So she goes crazy, and uh, everybody starts looking for the baby. So what do they find on the windowsill? They find on the windowsill of the baby's window um, is a ransom note in an envelope then down below the they find the dissembled or, or fallen down ladder the ladder is really an interesting intricate part of the case the ladder is very very important to the case uh, it's a three-part ladder that slides into extends itself if you pull it up and dowels are inserted homemade ladder Dowels are inserted at the end of each three-piece section. Quite, a, quite a, a, a device made to just to climb up there. It was pretty high up. And, and, and very light. It was made in a manner to where it was like as exactly as wide as need be to yeah. get yeah, up yeah, yeah, the yeah. ladder and still carry it. And Right. Now, the, the, the reason the to, one of the reasons the ladder is important is when the baby carrier came down one of the rungs of the ladder broke and people believe that he dropped the baby at this time, killing the baby upon impact on its skull. Uh, mm -hmm. The autopsy of the baby's skull shows a fractured skull on one side and what looks like almost a bullet hole on the other side, like it was pierced with a steel rod. So that's something that was never resolved in the history of the case, what happened to the baby, how the baby actually died. Uh, the baby will be found months later within a few miles of their property, uh, completely um, withered away. A truck driver came out to take a leak out of his truck and walked through a field, and there was the baby, the remnants of the baby, but the clothing was on the baby, some blonde hair locks were still remaining on the baby, and the baby suit was still on the baby. From what I understand, oh, yeah, that's a great that's a great photo. They uh, reenacted it, from what I understand, though. Rebuilt yes. the ladder from scratch. Yes. yes. And when they had the person try it, who was around 160 pounds, they gave him a sandbag that had the same weight as the baby. Ah. The same rung broke. I think it was rung 16 or something wow. like that, and wow. split, and and he dropped it. So that they, they wow. literally duplicated the event itself. And I think now many people believe that no one person that there had to be two people, and we're going to get into that, but just to get back to the, the, the crime itself, this baby is the most famous baby in the world. The closest thing would be like the royals. Royalty, in, yeah. royalty yeah, in England, right? Like somebody stealing that new kid. What's sure. the, the, the Whatever that new kid's name is, somebody kidnapping that kid, probably the closest. Archie? Thing. Archie, Maybe. somebody stealing Archie. I think that would be the equivalent. And then Archie turning up dead. Now, the investigation doesn't go anywhere for almost two years, Eric. It, it, the, whole, the whole nation goes berserk because a guy who's the head of the New Jersey State Police uh, named Norman Schwarzkopf is in charge of the investigation. And Schwarzkopf um, is at wit's end to make this thing uh, have a resolution. And he doesn't really have the help of the FBI because of the, the, the Lindbergh insistence that in the ransom note, it says, keep the police out of this. And Lindbergh literally takes over the investigation himself. And Schwarzkopf is the head of the state police. And then we've got a prosecutor named Willens, David Willens, who's going to come into a view here. That's Schwarzkopf on the left, and I think that's uh, Lindbergh on the right, if I'm correct. 
Yeah. So uh, Schwarzkopf was a military guy. He fought in World War One. He had a son uh, who later became famous. Um, oh, there's Willens. There's, there's, Will, there's Willens in the middle. That was Willens. If you could show, I, I, I'll go back to the son, and then I'll go back to Willens. <laughs> you might know who the son is. That's Norman Schwarzkopf Jr. The father was the head of the biggest name in Jersey because he was the head of the state police. And both of them went to West Point, both of them military guys. Um, so there's Willens. He was kind of a weasel. He was born in wow. Russia. What's that? Doesn't look that like that at all. <laughs> no, he later became, or he is here. He's actually attorney general of New Jersey. He tries the case, never tried a case before, a, a real street thug. And it's interesting that a, a immigrant from Russia is trying a immigrant from Germany. Nobody's ever pointed out the oddity of this, you know, that this guy here, you know, it's first gen he came over when he was born in, in Russia and came over and he later becomes one of the biggest Democratic power brokers in uh, New Jersey and on the national stage, literally handpicking um candidates to run for president. That's how much this trial put him in power, Willens himself. He has a son, uh, I think named Sean Willens or uh, Robert Willens, a son uh, who later becomes chief justice of the, of the uh, New Jersey Supreme Court. That's how big this guy got from this, this one trial. Well, oh, another guy got really big out of it too. Who? Ver. yes. Who? Ver. yes. J. Edgar Burr? Hoover got... Hoover. Oh, well, he, he's in a way, he's kind of, of a peripheral figure because he's really not hands on in this thing. He kind of helps out, but he, then he takes over as soon as they right, as soon but as not be, he's it. not involved in this case because you've got a guy who is the suspect who we're going to get to in a second, uh, who was arrested in the Bronx and the crime happens in Jersey. So he's extradited to Jersey, but it's not. And I think this is interesting. The kidnapping did not cross state lines. You know what I mean? The crime itself is not a later on. They have the Lindbergh baby law, which means the death penalty mm. for kidnapping. But the kidnapping itself uh, did not cross state lines. It was internal. At least they thought it was because they found the body of the kid a few miles from the house. So it's kind of an interesting situation. The trial itself, which... <laughs> which was a pig circus, um, They let, let's just get back to Houtman. And Houtman passes a $10 gold note to buy gas at a gas station. Now, the guy at the gas station, this is really interesting. The, there's a $10 gold note. The guy at the gas station writes the license plate number on the bill. Now, people said he called the police, he wrote the light. That's a crock of shit. The, the, the IRS supplied the $50,000, the IRS and the Treasury Department supplied the actual $50,000 in ransom money to Lindbergh. It was and clever. Re What's that? It was clever because of the Absolutely gold standard was going away. And they're right. like, hey, well, in no, a few the months. The gold notes, the actual gold notes, they were recorded serial numbers. And they but, sent them to every bank in the country. But so it goes it, further than that because the gold standard is going away within right, right. one year. Yeah. And they said, put all the money on the gold standard so people have to turn it in. Which is a separate issue. Absolutely true. But they gave him $50,000 in gold notes. And mm -hmm. nobody knew that these notes were going to be literally worthless in two years. And that, that was part of the genius of the, of the cops or the IRS, at least. And there's the license plate number. He writes it down. Now, the, the, the bank in the Bronx finds this note, not the not the guy from the gas station. He he deposits it in his account. Mm -hmm. And he and he, the reason he wrote down the license plate number was to prove that he wasn't going to get burned and ripped off. Well, he thought it was counterfeit or it could be counterfeit. It, it, the equivalent and it's of like, counterfeit. The equivalent yep. of counterfeit. So the license plate, they find the guy in the gas station, they find the car, they find the plate, they find Houtman, they go to his house, they arrest Houtman, and that was the footage you saw at the beginning, was the arrest of Richard Houtman. A lot of people called him Bruno, but even in sixth grade in Germany, uh, he listed his name as Richard Houtman. They used Bruno to Germanize him and to make him into a Hun, which was his middle name or the reverse. But well, he, he was Bruno Richard Houtman. 
Right, but he didn't yeah. go by Bruno. His wife didn't call him Bruno. No friends right. called him Bruno. His parents didn't call him Bruno. In school, he was Richard Hauptman. They mm. called him Bruno to Germanize him for the uh, uh, the PR. And here he is there in the cell. That's, I believe, in uh, New Jersey, actually, and maybe in Flemington or in uh, 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 Newark or something. But the trial is going to be a giant pig circus and everyone shows up and the cameras are in the courtroom. There's guys, reporters in the courtroom. They hire a guy, this is really interesting, named Edward Riley. Edward Riley, look at this scene. I mean, this is crazy. They were climbing through the windows. They were literally going on the side, climbing through the windows. They're, they're selling, the kids have a, 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 a side swag thing selling miniature ladders on the... You would have loved this. If you were eight, you would have been selling miniature ladders outside to make a little side money. So <laughs> the, the miniature ladders are like miniature nooses. But the the Edward Riley becomes the defense attorney, and he's known as the bull of Brooklyn, Edward Riley, the top attorney. But he's being paid by the tabloids. So his loyalty is to give the tabloids inside stories every day. And Hearst made them directly. Yeah, they paid him directly. He gave them inside stories. And one year after the trial, here he is on the left talking to Houtman. One year after the trial, he ends up in an alcoholic sanitarium for the rest of his life. I think also he was so certain of the guilt of his client that he spent exactly, I believe, 38 minutes with them. Except that his staff knew he was innocent. The staff, no, his staff in, fought for him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This guy. And, and he, and let me tell you something. When you look into the the actual transcripts of the case, uh, he shreds himself. Riley shreds a lot of prosecution witnesses. At, at mm -hmm. one point, there was a guy. There was, there was a guy who claimed to have seen Houtman driving to the house with the ladder in the house. Uh, in the in a car in the car driving there it was a complete crock of shit complete crock of shit but he he testified as many did under oath and lied that uh, the guy's name was um hackmuth and he said he saw him driving with a ladder um so as he's testifying the power and lights goes out in the courthouse and riley says the lord has stricken a lying witness your honor Oh, nice. <laughs> Very nicely played by Riley. But uh, yeah, so one of the witnesses they interview is um, in this slam dunk case. Now, keep in mind, they find $14,000 in the wall of his house. That's not good. The ladder, one of the boards from the ladder, they, they bring in uh, about one of the boards of the ladder they bring in a um, xylotomist. They bring in an actual xylotomist into the case. You know what a xylotomist is? Mm -hmm. It's one of the first cases they've. Uh, it was a very important case of forensic evidence at the time. It was right. a. I, I don't remember, but it's it's measuring the amount of um, blades that are used for planing. No, no. Well, the xylotomist is a wood expert. Is a wood expert. Right. He worked for the Department of the Forestry, and he brought yeah. in and he was able to line up the the wood, the grain of the wood from the attic, one of the planks right. in the attic to the ladder. Mm -hmm. That was what this, I mean, this, they had this guy. They tied it through South Carolina as the distribution point. That the, right. The, the guy went were, crazy. The wood guy went absolutely berserk. Arthur Keller was the guy's name. 47 year old, bald headed guy, a uh, complete maniac about wood. And he just went, no, no, the guy just was, you know, wood fanatic. Right, right. And he tied he, he took apart that ladder into 16 separate pieces and analyzed where each piece of wood came from. Some of it was wood laying around, but other parts, this one part, which they showed the jury, they brought the whole ladder into the courtroom, by the way. They assembled the whole ladder, put it in the courtroom. And uh, they said to, um, to Houtman, uh, did you build this? Did you ever build a ladder? And he said, of course, I'm a carpenter. You know, that was a, and the audience broke up laughing, you know. Said, I'm a carpenter. Of course, I build ladders. You know what I mean? But mm. what they didn't tell everybody and what they brought out in the case was when he was in common Germany, when he was a, um, uh, before he came over 11 years prior, he was arrested 
on a, on a number of uh, charges. Mm -hmm. And one of them was strong arm robbery of women with baby carriages. And a second one that he was arrested was breaking into the second floor house of the mayor of the city with a ladder that he had used. Not too good, Hunley. Not too good. And they found the records from Germany and entered them into the court case. And so this is got, after he lied and said, no, no, I'm clean. Nothing. No, right. Nothing okay. So he Germany. lies initially. He lies initially saying there's no more money. And he he does lie because he hasn't told his wife about the money. He also said that the money uh, was there because his friend Fish had taken yeah, yeah. off and gone to Germany. Okay. And, okay. So and he had a okay. box, a shoe box, and then there was right. a rain oh, still. Look, just for the <laughs> argument's sake, let's say that this is true because it was a time when people were uh, investing money in all kinds of schemes in the roaring 20s and everything else. And sure. Isidore Fish, who was his friend, a, a real man, showed up and took money for investments, not only from, from him, but from other friends of his. And the guy went back to Germany and died of tuberculosis and everybody lost their, their investment with Isidore Fish. And f before he left, Isidore Fish, now this is Hauptmann's story. Before he left, Isidore Fish gave him a package and he put the package in the closet, never opened the package. That's, that's Hauptmann's story. In that package is $14,000 worth of cash, okay? Now, Isidore Fish, who they laughed about, uh, was a real person. So, I mean, it, whether he gave them the money, of course, is, is highly suspect. But um, Isidore Fish, and I, the reason I keep saying his name, becomes famous for one thing. Because one of the writers, whether it was Damon Runyon or one of the others, said, there's something fishy about this story. That came from his name, Isidore Fish. Oh. That phrase in our culture, there's something fishy about it, came from Isidore Fish. Nice. All right. So that's why that's why he's kind of famous, because of fishy. You know, something fishy about it. But the miniature ladders are being sold. Walter Winchell's in the courtroom. Um, they bring in uh, Betty Gow. And he shreds Betty Gow, the nurse. He, what, what Riley's trying to do is create any kind of doubt in the jury, Eric. So mm -hmm. here's is, is this Betty Gow. Mm -hmm. Betty Gow is shredded by Riley on the stand. And Riley, she then faints and passes out right onto the floor of the courtroom. And everybody goes crazy. She passes out. Now, Violet, uh, 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 Viola Sharp can't make it to be. <laughs> Viola Sharp, who is the maid, if you could show a picture of Viola Sharp, there's one of her on a motorcycle that's really weird. Mm -hmm. um, Viola Sharp, which you'll see on the bottom, very bottom left. Yeah, sure. that's one of her bows, I think, or the butler. Viola Sharp is interrogated twice as an inside tip woman because nobody knew that the baby or the or them, the 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 the, the couple would even be there, the, you know, for that weekend. So Viola Sharp gets interrogated twice and the, they show up a third time, the police to interrogate her. And she runs upstairs and guzzled down a bottle of silver polish, which has uh, uh, potassium chloride in it. And she dies instantly. Mm -hmm. So everybody says, oh, my God, there's got to be a conspiracy here. And that's where the conspiracy really begins to take off. Well, it's, and it's not untoward because no, they, no. they were coming back to question her. Right. And it's very similar. Uh, you know, John Douglas covered this case and he compared her um, to Leonard Lake, who, who got arrested for minor charges in the 80s, mm -hmm. gets taken into custody. Um, they give him a drink. All of a sudden he's on the floor frothing. And they're oh, like, wow. What you just had a couple stolen tools? What, you know, what's going on? Why did this guy do it? Right. And it turns out that he was partners with uh, Charles Ng, and they were both oh right, serial killers right. who right. videoed and did all kinds. Right, of stuff. right, right. Good point. Good point. So very yeah. interesting. Yeah. So she drinks the silver polish. She's dead. But but there are other suspects. There are other suspects. There's a woman named Elizabeth Morrow, and you say, well, who's Elizabeth Morrow? That's Anne Morrow's sister. Now Anne Morrow's sister mm. is mentally unstable. Okay. One time she took the baby and stuffed it into the hamper in the bathroom and they couldn't find the baby. Did you know this? This is insane. I found no. this out recently. So the Lindberghs banned his sister 
from ever coming near the baby. I, this is a separate thing. Now, a third thing, this is even crazier. Charles Lindbergh himself would do pranks. One of the pranks he did, this is three weeks before the kidnapping, he took the baby, hid it in the closet, and told his wife the baby had been kidnapped. Did you know this? No, I missed okay. that. <laughs> okay, just, okay, just think about what I just told you. The father of the baby, and this has been documented by the maid, the butler, and everybody else, um, took the baby, hid it in the closet to freak his wife out and said the baby had been kidnapped three weeks before the kidnapping. Now, you say, why would Lindbergh be in on this? Lindbergh was a eugenicist, and the baby had rickets, and the baby had some mental problems. That's something wrong with his skull. And he believed, possibly, that this baby was not the best and the brightest. And back in those days, yeah, he obviously, he was a eugenicist, and we'll get into it at the end, what happens to him at the end of this story. But the fact that he was a true believer in eugenics and believed in, 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 in genes, and he had a baby, that there was something wrong with the baby. Now, back in those days, they would institutionalize a baby if you had something wrong with it. They, hmm. okay, they were giving the baby sun lamp treatments. They were shoving vitamin D into this baby. They had, his legs were kind of twisted. Uh, he had rickets. So some theorize that he was in on this, Lindbergh. He was in on the kidnapping. And his motivation was to get rid of the baby. And look, it's a crazy theory, but he was supposed to have a speaking engagement in New York. He came home. Uh, he said he forgot about it. He was there that night. He was. They were just downstairs. They heard nothing. Him and his wife are sitting there in the house, nine o'clock in the evening, and they hear absolutely nothing of a guy breaking in upstairs. It sounds preposterous that they would be unheard. And also, there were two sets of footprints at the base of the ladder. And most people believe there is no way. You had to take the baby from the window, Eric, and mm. hand it over to a guy on the ladder. You couldn't just take the baby like a football and swing out of that window onto the ladder. Mm -hmm. Plus, somebody's got to be holding it down below. So they, they, And the footprints were there. The, they, they fucked up. They screwed up the uh, uh, Jersey police. They never even measured the footprints. They never mm -hmm. even measured them. Now, now, keep in mind, Houtman's fingerprints are on nothing. That room, the room itself, was wiped so clean that Lindbergh's and the uh, staff's fingerprints were not in there. Nobody's. Mm -hmm. Nobody. Somebody wiped down that entire room before they left with the baby. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the baby, this is another one, had thumb handcuffs on. The baby had handcuffs on its thumbs chained to the bars of its crib. And they found one of the thumb cuffs down below embedded in the driveway. People had stepped on it and nobody ever found it as evidence until Gao, I think, that's where she was testifying, that she had found the thumb handcuffs. Now you say, what do you need thumb handcuffs for? Yes. <laughs> it was to stop the baby from learning how to suck its thumb. And they God had forbid. these right. Well, they the thumb is gonna the thumbs are gonna come into play later with a guy named John Knoll who had unusual thumbs. We, we'll get into that in a little bit. But the baby, look, I mean, if you're a eugenicist and believe in this the master race and you have a defective baby, babies have been jettisoned to institutions for far less than Charlie Jr. had. You know, you're an elite couple and this kid um, has something wrong with it. You know, you might be might be uptight about that. So keep that in mind. Now, dig it in the note. And we wanted to talk about John. Uh, what's his name? The, the uh, high school principal, right? Yeah. John uh, Conlon. John Conlon. Um, Jack, yeah. John, Jack's, Jack's or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John Conlon writes a letter. He uh, lives in the Bronx. He's a former high school principal, retired. Here he is. John Conlon. He's a, he's a busybody. He's a big mouth. He's a know-it-all. He writes a letter to uh, uh, Lindbergh that he will be happy to be the go-between, the kidnappers and um, Lindbergh. So Lindbergh, who's taken over the case himself, says, okay, that's great. So John Conlon begins to receive letters. People in a cab would pull up 
and the cab driver would give him a letter saying, I don't know, this guy gave me this letter to give to you. And in there it would say, go to this cemetery on 233rd Street in the Bronx. He'd get to the cemetery. They'd say, go to the next cemetery. And finally, there's Conlon. Yeah, there he is. He goes to a cemetery and he meets a guy who says his name is John. This complete pitch black night. And John tells him uh, to bring the $50,000. He'll be notified where to go. There's a few more letters that are sent to Conlon. And Conlon and Lindbergh, although Lindbergh is waiting back by the car, Conlon comes back with the $50,000 marked bills. They're not marked, but they're obviously recorded. And gives them to this guy, John. He says his name is John. He sits on the bench with him talking about uh, the baby. He says the baby's fine. He's on a boat. And he has a nurse full time. Now, keep in mind, this is two months, Eric. Mm. It's two months of a little baby, 20 months old. Uh, but John and his underlings, whoever they are, swear that the baby's OK. And they gives him a, a envelope. In that envelope is the name of the boat called the Nelly, and it's docked or at, at sea in Martha's Vineyard. I don't know if it's docked, but he said the Nelly is the ship that you can find the baby on, and it's on Martha's Vineyard. Lindbergh runs and jumps in his plane and begins flying from New Jersey to Martha's Vineyard, flies around day after day after day, and cannot find, because there is no boat, the Nelly. Right. And he was crestfallen and completely destroyed by the fact that he has just given $50,000 to the kidnappers and there's no baby. There's a little um, segment in there too. I don't know if you got it in your notes about the, uh, how it was $70,000 and Conlon talked the guy into taking 50. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It was, they wanted to raise the price. They did raise it. Well, it's significant because the 20,000 was the especially marked bills that were the absolute easiest to find and those are the ones he wound up throwing back to Lindbergh, and the IRS is like, shit. Right. We wanted well, don't those forget bills. Outman is starting to buy things now with these 10 and 20 and $100 bills. You know, in, mm -hmm. in the ransom note, it delineates the uh, different amounts of each bill, right, Eric? I mean, it's mm -hmm. been thousands of $10 bills, this yep. amount of 20s. So he begins to pass these notes around New uh, the Bronx uh, buying shit. He uh, goes to the movie theater. The movie the guy gets one. So, mm -hmm. but the point of the matter is he's only got mathematically a third yep. of the money. And that may indicate that he was the, the third wheel, you know? Well, there was another deposit that they found, but they couldn't trace the source. It was um, some name J something or another or whatever, right. but it came out of the German community and it, you know, couldn't be tied to him. It was like that. They, they just, they had no idea who it was as a bogus address. And right. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on in here. There's a this guy named John Knoll that people talk about. And John Knoll um, was a deli clerk in the Bronx who was also a German immigrant and may have been a friend of Hauptmann's. And John Knoll looks exactly like this John Knoll. He looks exactly like the police sketch that Condon gave to the police. Look at this. That's John Knoll on the right. This is the police sketch of the man that Condon claims he gave the money to. Look at those two people. I mean, have you seen a more accurate police sketch of a suspect in your life? So John Knoll has two discerning characteristics. If you go back to that previous photo, John Knoll, if you, if you, if you look closely at his thumbs, he has enormously large thumbs. And the reason this is important is that John Condon, the old man, said the Cemetery John, which is, he's alleging is this guy, had enormous thumbs. Look at this guy's thumbs. They're like deformed thumbs. Hmm. Now, my theory is this on the thumbs. I've got a theory about the thumbs because this photo is just the freakiest thing you've ever seen. Noel is a guy that was never investigated by the New Jersey or New York police authorities. When Lindbergh gets arrested, he flees to Detroit from the Bronx, stays with his sister the entire trial, doesn't come back. Hmm. When, when he does come back, he books a cruise on a 
super expensive ocean liner, first class, first class with his wife. This is a guy who works in a deli. Here's a photo of him in the in in the dining room. That's him again with his wife. Nobody knows how he could afford this. The ticket was like seven hundred dollars for each of them, right? Good lord, that's goes to money, Bremen man. in Germany and comes back the day after Hauptmann is executed or convicted, not executed, convicted, returns to the United States. The, the heat is off, which sounds a little bit like our old friend Jenny Chiba going to Boston and then <laughs> coming back when the heat was off in the Elliott Smith case. But nobody knows where he got the money and why he had those crazy thumbs. I'm going to put my theory in about the thumbs from my own experience. I'm going to tell you right now what I think about the thumbs. Those two thumbs have been sliced so many times as a deli mm. clerk because I was a deli clerk. I did this in high school. I worked at Wallbaums. I worked at Grand Union, and I was a deli clerk. And the manager of that deli clerk had two butchered thumbs. That, you know what I mean? That were just always getting cut by the slicer. So like scar tissue building. Yes, up and right. And I think that's what he said because Condon, and no one's ever said this. It's just my theory from the show. You could do what you want with my dots. Condon said the man had two deformed thumbs. And not that they were normally large, but that they were deformed. And I hmm. think that's from the cutting from the slicing of meat. Could be. Yeah. Okay. Now here's the plot twist traces of animal fat was found on the ransom bills. Hmm. Think about that, Hunley. Traces of animal fat found on, not all of them, but some of the, some of the um, ransom bills that they got. So while we're at it, who, who looks closer, Houtman or um, no? Well, look at Houtman's eyes. Look at Houtman's eyes. Look at the mouth. Look at the nose. Look closely. I mean, the ears are kind of there, but everything else is kind the of The eyes off. are a little off and yeah. they match in the, I think the eyes are pretty, because the guy has two different, you know, leveled eyes like Houtman, mm -hmm. but it's right. they both kind of look like him. Right. That's been alleged that the sketch could be Houtman. Now, okay, back by the car, uh, when he's hanging back is Lindbergh, and the guy, the Cemetery John guy, yells out, I am here, doctor. You know, here, doctor. In German, mm -hmm. heavily German accent. So both Condon and Lindbergh testified, lied under oath in their testimony, uh, saying that that was Houtman, without any shadow of a doubt. They flipped both those guys. Condon, in a lineup, could not identify Houtman in a lineup. He said, that's not the man. He also couldn't identify the voice of Houtman, which they had him call out the name and the phrase that was in the park, in the cemetery. The same thing with Lindbergh, denied that he could identify it. They, the police flipped both of them saying, we need your help. And they both flipped their testimony and, you know, lied under oath. A lot of people lied under oath mm -hmm. because of the magnitude and gravity of the case. In other words, this was an, a typical, just like we saw in Dallas, they believe this is the guy and they frame the case around their presumed suspect because of political pressure. Exactly the same. The cops were framing the case around Houtman, flipping people and intimidating people. They threatened Dr. John Condon. This is why he flipped with being a co-conspirator. And he said, you got to be shitting me. And they said, nope, we're going to charge you as a co-conspirator. Now, does that sound like Buell Wesley Frazier or not? True, and, but in, in fairness, too, I think that they had a little bit to go on. I mean, that evidence against Houtman is damning. It, I mean, the, right, but the it's letter, all the money, the, 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 I, the I, handwriting I, analysis doesn't match. They couldn't yeah. get a handwriting analysis to guy to come forward and do it. Everyone they said can't no match here, but they did yeah. find a match from a guy named John Knoll, something like sixty percent match from his letters. A couple of years later. Well, that's even that's in dispute. They some handwriting yeah, oh, yeah. experts no, said that they did match, and yeah. then one of them said no, it doesn't match. Then there's that other piece of evidence where he actually had Conlon's phone number written in his oh, son's yeah, that's, closet. That's a tough one. That's not the, a good the, one. Up in the closet. Yeah, he had on the wall. That was tough. Yeah, that's and he tough. didn't deny it. Right. No, no, no. <laughs> that's a tough one. That's a tough one. I, I got to admit, that's a tough one. So it's like, but. Uh. <laughs> but you know, the question is, do you deserve the electric chair for um, this tangential, you know, 
evidence that there's no fingerprints, Eric. There's no witnesses. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's physically not connected to the crime. I mean, he has the money. He he says, this is how I got the money. You know, this is, you know, the guy's dead, but, you know, it could be. You know, how certain could the jury be? No, I, I, I agree. And, and by the way, even at the time, um, one of the things that bothered people was Houtman would not take a plea. The governor okay. himself. Right. We're going to get to that. We're going to get yeah. to that because that's just crazy. That's just completely fucking nuts. The, the jury comes out and returns a guilty verdict. And the judge uh, says he sentences him to death mm -hmm. in, Trent, in Trent, New Jersey. The governor has his own investigative team. And from the beginning, his chief investigator uh, says that Outman is innocent. He gives him a full report, an 85-page report, saying he doesn't believe Houtman did it. And if he did, he did not do it alone and does not deserve to take the rap for the guys who got away. And there's a certain logic to that. And the governor secretly, on three occasions, the governor of the state of New Jersey goes and meets with Houtman undercover in his cell. And that's real. And he says, I want to hear this story from the guy's mouth. And mm -hmm. Houtman convinces him that he didn't do the crime. But the governor in the state of New Jersey, under their constitution, does not have the right to pardon uh, a condemned man. Well, I didn't know that about Jersey. That's, That's right. I, I, I didn't know that either. I didn't know that either. So he goes and has a meeting with two guys privately. The governor um, goes and meets, he's a Republican governor, he goes and meets with Schwarzkopf and Willens, and they tell him to go fuck themselves, to fuck himself. And Willens was the only guy who could open this case, the prosecutor is the attorney general. And he says, and he's known, he's known the governor their whole life. They're both sports writers at like the Trenton uh, Times or something, sports writers. That's where these guys came from. The governor too. So he says to the governor, he says, let me tell you what's going to happen. He says, you're going to stick to this thing. You're going to you're going to give a couple of delays and you can't pardon him. And you're going to he has a report in his hand. He says, the guy's going to go to the chair. I'm not going to change my story. Schwarzkopf's not going to change his story. The state of New Jersey is not going to change his story. You're never going to be reelected for the rest of your life. Right. And and the governor thinks about it and he says, holy shit, he's right. Right. So they come up. It's just what you were alluding to. They come up with a compromise to save Houtman from the electric chair. And he goes back to the cell and he tells Houtman the three man compromise that they came up with. And the compromise is this. If Houtman confesses to anything at all about being part of a plot with the other men, with the other men, whoever the other men are, he can avoid the electric chair. That's all he's got to do. That's all he's got to do. He's just got to come up. And they said, the governor says, it doesn't even matter. He says, come up with, I don't even care. He says, come up with whatever you want. And he says, he says, the three of us will then give you life in prison. Um, and he wouldn't do it. And his wife shows up and his wife says, his wife is like just one of the most honest women in the history of the world. She says, I can't ask you the lie. He's got a 20 month infant, 20 month old infant child, the same as Lindbergh's. And his wife says, I cannot ask you to lie. Just starts crying in the cell, outside the cell. And he realizes that he can't lie and make this thing up. And the two of them start sobbing. The baby's there actually in the Trenton death house. And she gives the baby to the prison matron. And she's and she couldn't even ask her own husband. She knew the deal to make up a story to save his life as the husband and father of that baby. And he said, I have to go to the electric chair. I mean, th that's I, I don't know. You could say whatever you want about Houtman, but that is an incredibly powerful statement about his innocence. And then she is told that's her collapsing when he was electrocuted. But let me just read the statement that Houtman made his final statement. Let me just read this to the audience so you know what I'm talking about. It's April 3rd, 1936. It's from um, Houtman. I am glad that my life in a world which has not understood me has ended. Soon I will be at home with my Lord. So I am dying an innocent man, 
Should, however, my death serve for the purpose of abolishing capital punishment, such a punishment being arrived at only by circumstantial evidence, I feel that my death has not been in vain. I am at peace with God. I repeat, I protest my innocence of the crime for which I was convicted. However, I die with no malice or hatred in my heart. The love of Christ has filled my soul, and I am happy in him. Now, I, I don't know who on earth can believe that this is a lie after reading that letter and going to the electric chair. You know, I mean, all he had to say was, some guys hired me, I was part of the plot, and I'm good to go. I and, held the ladder. I wasn't even there. No. <laughs> right, whatever. I, I mean, he could have said anything. Yeah. I would have been making stories up about astronauts coming and taking the baby. I could... You know, I mean, anything yeah. just to get off. Yeah, I'd say some and, guys, I sold a guy a ladder. What do you want? Okay, so <laughs> Schwarzkopf, Norman Schwarzkopf, and the governor, and Willens are together waiting for this phone call that he is going to recant at the 11th hour and come up with this compromise because they know that the evidence against him and the plot itself is so weak that they will be marred for the rest of their lives as having, this was their fear that they discussed among themselves, that the real guys are going to be caught in five years, two years, 10 years, and their careers are going to be destroyed, Eric. That was their fear. And they were certain when they came up with this scheme that he would buckle and not go to the chair. That's Schwarzkopf especially was certain. And he sat in that chair in the second row, Schwarzkopf, watching him fry and the hair on fire from the electric chair and the smell of death coming off of Houtman in that death house in Trenton State, New Jersey prison. And he couldn't believe, he threw up into his own hands. He couldn't believe what was going, that, that he didn't buckle. And the, the warden said, do you have any final thing to say? And there was nothing. He wrote, he had written this letter and they stood and looked at him in disbelief as, you know, when you go to these um, electrocutions, it's like frying meat, Eric. You know, the smell of death and meat burning and the hair. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's an incredibly brutal thing to witness. And there was like, I, I want to say like 30 or 40 guys in there, you know, in that, in that uh, uh, viewing room. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was no plexiglass back then. No, no, he was right there in that death house. He was right there. And they had a big giant wheel that mm -hmm. turned up the electricity. A wheel, like, you know, some sort of big electric, you know, electricity turner. And it had a needle and everything. It looked like, like a prop out of a movie. Well, I mean, that was close to the time that um, Einstein had that. Not Einstein, but... Um, Tesla and, uh, Con and Edison. Edison had it created to show that ACDC would kill people. That's why he invented it. So it's very right. Well, that, the first one was in Sing Sing across the river, yeah. um, which but this was a crime in New Jersey. So he was he was fried in the Trenton uh, big house. But the wife got a 30 day reprieve. Uh, the, the, the governor did give him was able to give reprieves. It did go to the U.S. Supreme Court. They voted seven to one or eight to one. Maybe it was seven to one. I don't know. It was only eight votes or something. Uh, to deny um, uh, a stay of execution. Mm -hmm. So every single legal avenue was uh, was used, including the, the reprieve of 30 days when the governor began to look, even to offer him the deal. That was mm -hmm. during stay. And then he goes to the death house and he's dead. And that's when John Knoll comes back from Bremen on the, on the ship. And, you know, he he may or may not have been one of the key guys, you know, in the, yeah. in the plot. Yeah, by, the way, Al, by the way, Al Capone put up a $10,000 reward. Just oh, so you right. know that, right? <laughs> Al Capone even put up a reward. But, so. was in Alcatraz when he put up the uh, reward, too, which is Well, he's a good crazy. guy, you know what I mean? So, but uh, anyway, so there was the rumor about Elizabeth, the sister, killing the baby. There's the rumors about, the, uh, about uh, uh, Sharp being involved in the killing of the baby. Um, I mean, there's all these different things that were never resolved. And the disabled baby story, you know, whatever. But I'm saying the, the fact that he hid the, his own kid in the closet, Eric, that one really got me. 
That one really got me that he kidnapped his own kid as a stunt, not as a stunt, as a prank. He was a prankster. That's been the, the explanation that he had these stupid pranks. Now, you say to yourself, you know, what happens to this guy? What happens to um, to Charles Lindbergh? What happens? He has right. another baby. He has another yeah. baby, right? Sure. And in 1933, 1936, he flies to Germany. And here he befriends uh, this guy in the photo that you're going to show. He gets an award from Hermann Goering, the head of the Luftwaffe. That's another Nazi guy in the middle. That's Lindbergh accepting the award of a top American Nazi, I guess. And and Goering is going, you know, great to have you. He meets with Hitler. Ford liked him, too. Ford liked <laughs> him. But, but I'm saying this is after the baby is dead. He goes with his wife with the new baby to meet with Hitler from 1936 to 1939. And he you know, embraces eugenics. He embraces the master race. He's not hiding it. This is the number one American hero of the earth. Now, in, in 39, he comes back and he's trying to help, the, you know, the Defense Department, obviously, you know, in terms of the war, the war era in 41. But after the war, now, this is the part I wanted the audience to hear, because this is the one that really struck me as being bizarre, what I'm going to tell you right now. And I don't know how else to tell you, except that this is one of the craziest dots I've ever stumbled onto. In 1958, he goes back to Germany after the war. Charles Lindbergh goes back to Germany under the assumed name of Carew, C-A-R-E-W, Kent. Carew Kent. And you just go, well, why does he need the pseudonym Carew Kent? He, with his wife and his kid, he marries three additional German women and gives birth and sires seven to 13 additional children under the assumed name of Carew Kent. Everyone is sworn to secrecy of these families. He's got four wives. This has all been documented. I'm going to show you a photo of, of the documentation in a second. He sires between seven and 13. It's kind of debatable as to how many children he sired with these three wives, all Germanic blondes, all blue-eyed, statuesque, knockout Nazi blondes <laughs> that he has married in Germany separately. And what happened was in 1974, after he died, these three of the kids came out and had a press conference. Those are three out of the either 12 or seven of his children from these four or three German wives. And he believed that he was creating a master race post uh, World War II. No, he, he was the top pilot in the world. <laughs> I mean, wow, wow. <laughs> Which leads critics to believe that he may have frowned upon his own son's disabilities as a eugenics fanatic, that the kid might have been a, a disaster for him politically, socially, scientifically, uh, because of the brain skull thing and the rickets, and maybe he had the kid kidnapped uh, and worked with him. Now, keep in mind, he was, now, this is really weird, he was in charge of the investigation. Mm -hmm. He had that he, much sway. He was so powerful that he can just dictate. No, he turned do down J. Edgar Hoover's efforts to help him. By the way, he mm -hmm. told the FBI to stay out of it. He kept he kept Schwarzkopf at arm's length to the frustration of Norman Schwarzkopf. To the frustration, he ran this entire thing. Now he was wasn't he colonel in the army, Limburg? Yes, yes. Okay, so he had a military rank himself despite the stature and love of everyone. Yeah, he, he did. Um, but he kept everybody out. He had, he was so famous and so powerful. I mean, he'd be kind of like Bill Gates or somebody in that, in terms of that, probably able to keep right. them at bay or, or whatever. Right. But I mean, here's a guy who sides with the Nazis, who's a eugenics uh, guy, meets with Hitler, gets an award from Hitler. And nobody seems to find this to be bizarre. You know, I mean, back then, um, 
you know, I don't get how he got away with it media wise. Why? Well, I, I guess he was just so big they couldn't attack him, Eric, right? Was he no, just I mean, that famous? Yeah. I mean, uh, and it, the police didn't have the powers then that they do now. They've got more power, uh, you know, now with the feds, especially. Let me tell you something. They recently went to they have a museum in New Jersey and Trenton about the case museum. And they've got a guy who runs the museum who has all the files, like 100,000 files. Right. So these investigators in the past 10 years, the past 10, 11 years, went to the state of New Jersey because they have the envelopes that he mailed, that Noel mailed, that Lindbergh, uh, that that uh, Hauptman mailed and that has their DNA on it. And they could check the DNA, from, which they didn't have then. They could check the DNA of these envelopes, Eric, and see whose DNA is on the envelopes. And repeatedly, year after year after year after year, the state of New Jersey denies the a claim to check the DNA. Every <laughs> single year, the DNA will not be allowed to be tested by the state of New Jersey. That's not uncommon. I don't know what it is, but prosecutors mm -hmm. hate having DNA tested. It's like every case that's out there, there there's constantly... But for the love of God, Hunley, it's this, like, is just 70, test it. this is oh, 70, 80 years. What is... The, I mean, these guys have... The, the problem is, like we saw in the Sirhan case, the LAPD and the and the attorneys and the prosecutors had graduated up the ladder to become Supreme Court mm -hmm. justices in the state of California. And that's what happened in the state of New Jersey. The They made their bones. The same thing happened in the Sirhan RFK case. The police made their bones on the case, but and they moved up the political ladder. And mm -hmm. there were times when... Um, they tr oh, wait, wait, what's his name? The wife in 1981 goes to uh, sue the state of New Jersey and she goes up against Willens's son, who is the judge in the case. Well, and then you have a four star general as the son of somebody in the case. That's right. How, how, how much are you going to get there? Never mind um, Lindner being a colonel, four star general in, in charge of uh, Desert Storm. Hello? Well, I know mean, his father was, you know, fought in World War One. No, I know, but you've got a legacy here. So it's like, oh, yeah, no, 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 no. Does no, his saw one his father smeared or potentially smeared? No, or, you know, no. That's why they won't check the DNA. They won't give it to any of these authors. They won't give it to any state officials. They won't. They could resolve this thing in five seconds. Maybe mm -hmm. they checked it themselves, Eric, pr privately. Could be. Maybe they checked it themselves and they know that if this gets released, this DNA, even through FOIA, FOIA requests have been denied. I mean, what is the deal? And the deal is the legacy. The yeah, deal it has, is it'd have to be a suit. You you would have to actually, somebody would have to sue. Um, Hauptman does have descendants, doesn't he? He does. He does have those children. So that, that would be maybe a, a possibility is if one of his descendants could sue over it. Um, Right. To, for a pardon or something, because he has always claimed he well, was his innocent. wife tried in eighty one. His wife tried in eighty one, and she was denied. So right. there was an attempt. But the, the the wife lived to ninety six. She didn't die until nineteen ninety four. I think the wife lived until the mid nineties, mm. uh, ninety six years old, claiming that her husband was innocent throughout the mm. whole thing. Maybe and her then, kids can he, do it. What's that? Maybe the kids can do it. I mean, technically. Yeah. If, you know, there are people who are suing right now over, um, you know, sentences and getting them overturned, even though, you know, posthumously. Well, I just thought the John Knoll thing had some meat to the bone. And I don't mean that as a joke in terms of the deli clerk, but sure. the, the thumbs, you know, were, you know, he was all thumbs. Let me put it that way, Hunley. You know, so and, and, and I'll tell you something else. Hauptman was not that smart to come up with this himself. You know, as, as I think it was one of John Douglas, who was the guy you're talking about, the FBI yeah. guy? Is it John yeah, Douglas? John yeah, yeah, John Douglas said, he said, this is a multi person operation. This is not mm. one guy could not do all this stuff. It's ridiculous. One semi illiterate right. German is right. essentially how you put it. Right. And and the fact of the matter is, they it was probably a German plot. And I don't mean German, 
you know, that it was a plot from Germany. I just know the community. All, the yeah, yeah. They all knew each other. Sure. They probably lost their shirts in the stock market crash in 1929. I think he was involved. One way or another, Actually, I think he, he had to be involved. I mean, it was just involved. too much. It's just too much there. And he should have gotten a 20 year sentence. Yeah. Yeah, a 20 year right. sentence. But the political pressure to wrap this up was so enormous at that time for two years of this thing uh, not being resolved and the media involved and Riley, the uh, the lawyer being on the take and an alcoholic, you know, she could have sued for uh, having bad counsel. You know, the, the Riley mm -hmm. was incompetent. That would that could have been a suit. But you're right. It has to be the kids. At this point, mm -hmm. it's got to be the kids. The kids can sue saying they had... Uh, uh, bad, bad representation, and um, that the father was framed. I mean, there's a lot of uh... right, and that the, the technology wasn't available to test the evidence at the time. You have it. I don't know, but maybe they're maybe they're just saying we just want to be low profile. I don't know who they are even. Yeah, the door. They, they may be like, screw it. You know, I, I, we're just going to live our lives. But. Well, story. I mean, look at look at Oswald, Marina Oswald's daughters. They they are a low profile. I mean, a lot of these people just want to, uh, except for Ruth Payne, who loves being on TV. A lot of these a lot of these people don't want to be in the limelight anymore, Eric. Mm -mm. You know, yeah, I can't blame them. Right. Some people think that he went to the electric chair to save his wife and child from the uh, burden of him saying that he did it, that he was an innocent man, and that might help them. While he was in the afterlife, uh, it's, it's a weak. That's weak sauce. That's pretty weak sauce. Uh, uh, whatever it is, he's a stand-up dude. Right. I can say that because okay, if he was involved, he didn't roll on anybody. That's well, for damn sure. A lot of he, it. A lot of it is when he came to the United States. What his wife said, he had a change of character when they got married, and he had to do things in a post-World War One environment in Berlin that everybody was doing, which was robbing to eat and, you know, stealing mm -hmm. to survive in that debacle after World War One. Well, he was and, enlisted or um, drafted at 14. Yeah. So, I mean, he, he went through some shit. Oh, he definitely mm -hmm. went through some shit of shell shock and gas and everything else. Stows away on that ship and comes to the United States and he works quietly for 11 years, Eric. And, you know, has no record, no nothing, has a kid with a house and a wife, and he's totally straight up. I mean, it doesn't look good that he robbed a mayor's house for the latter. I'll give you that. That's that's not good. I mean, the latter crime, you know, former or latter, any way you want to look at it. It's kind of, <laughs> good I, pun. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Well, speaking of that, um, we got some cash coming in. Lindsay Mann's. What? Wants to thank us for our hard work. I oh, saved you. the super chat to the end. I hope oh, oh, people thanks, are cool with that, that because yeah. we're trying to give everybody the time that they deserve yeah, and yeah. not interrupt the flow. It does interrupt the you. flow of the story to see those things. I gotta tell you, maybe it's better at the end. But um, um, the Charkina uh, finally caught you all live. Love the channel. Yes, um, Rob from Line Lumber. What's along with lumber? Um, Rob is uh, one of the lawyers. He covered uh, Johnny Depp. He's out of Virginia. Okay. He did. Uh, like a three hour breakdown with Scott Cardinal, um, who's a fan of the channel, who watches too. Okay, cool. And they did a couple of weeks ago. I started to watch it, but then decided I, I didn't want to get too influenced on it. Just right. To, I tried to and, get all the major beats into this. It's a wild story. It could have been two episodes, but I, I'm trying to get the, the trial in and also the crime and the post crime. The stuff about Lindbergh really fascinates me and, mm -hmm. and always has. I mean, I've known this stuff for a long time about Lindbergh's obviously eugenics and uh, love of Hitler and the Nazis. But that was, sure. a, I, I did not know about the multiple wives and babies that he, he uh, uh, sired in Germany. I did not know that. He went nuts. Great topic. You're going to do some awesome work. Thanks to Barnes. Th yes. Thank you, Barnes. Barnes has been yeah, super Robert. Cool Wait, what's today? I'm going to see Barnes Friday. Today oh, is Tuesday. <laughs> Tuesday. Yes, it is. I'll see Barnes on Friday in, in uh, some other city in another state. Yeah. You to make our day in amazing stories. Secret April. Peace Thanks. Wolf. I'll go secret peace wolf. I like that. You got a super sticker from Heather, whatever. Whoa, whatever. Love it. Amazing information, guys. Wait, that's the same person. Peace wolf. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you. And also from um, Tarkina Meyer again, Mark, separate topics. I Thoughts on church. I ain't buying that. He's just a yeah. liberal dude who, you know, uh, his father was a crook. Yes. Who I believe was pardoned by. By the way, I'll tell you this much: Willens's David Willens's daughter 
the son became the head of the Supreme Court in New Jersey. The daughter married a guy, you talk about marrying up, named Leon Hess of Hess Oil, who owned the New York mm. Jets, who owned the New York Jets. Leon Hess. And we used to have these little Hess toy trucks, tankers as kids, that they used <laughs> to sell in the gas stations, at Hess gas station. Yeah, and yeah. every kid in Brooklyn had, uh, and, and in New York, had that Hess tanker truck, I think. Wow. Donald Thomas coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Great insight and entertainment. Wow. Okay. And we always have to pitch merch. Wait, wait. We've what about shirts. the subscribing thing? I'm curious about how we get more subscribers on me. You've got all kinds of bells and whistles down there. You got the sign, you got the ticker tape parade you do sometime. Hold on on the merch for a second, because we have to get to at least first 25,000 subscribers and then 50. That's all I care about. 25 and then 50. If we can get to 50, I think I could go to my grave, but who knows where it'll go after that. But 25, no, no, no. aren't we he, close? He can, he can go to his grave, but we need 100 <laughs> before he goes to the grave. I, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So let's say we, where are we now? Like 23 or something? Or uh, 23 and change. Okay. Uh, we can't get to 25? How difficult is this? I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm with them. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. Folks, help us out. What do you do? So you, you, you hit the button and then you yes. hit the notification. Do you hit all notifications or just some of them? All. You if you want to be notified, you hit all. Right. Like, I, I, don't I want assume to be notified. you want to see. <laughs> okay. Explain the likes to me because I don't understand what likes mean or why we have a discrepancy in how many viewers versus likes. What's the deal with the likes? What does that do for you? A like just literally says, I like this. At the right. But what does it mean for the, the algorithm? It tells YouTube that people are watching and they're engaging. Any kind of engagement from people, even a snarky comment from somebody in the comments, mm -hmm. is considered engagement. Oh, wow. And the lowest level engagement is a like. So it's right. the, the easiest thing of all. It's free. You just go, oh, like, there you go. And if they see there's a whole bunch of likes, then YouTube pushes it up the algorithm to more people. I see what you're saying. So if they like me... They can send PayPal contributions to me through PayPal is what you're saying. Well, they can hit the like button on the way. Right. Hit the like button, the content button, the swag button, which you're going to say now, but also the PayPal button. Dude. Oh, I just want to say something. I just got this in the mail. And this is directly from the PayPal people. This is a book on General Walker. Just so you know that your money. Right. No, 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 dude. I just got this today. I can't wait. I'm taking this. With me to see Barnes. That's like 2,000 pages? Dude, it is the only book ever written on General Walker. And this is a thanks to the PayPal people. That this could stop what, a bullet. This is going to go right here <laughs> underneath to stop bullets when we get into Walker. So I just want to give a shout out to show you this is not some crackpot theme. This is really being converted into uh, into intellectual currency by the people from PayPal. Hey, Georgina's here. Oh, thank, thank God. You. Oh, Hold she on. tried to convince her mom that Lindbergh was a horrible person mm -hmm. and that he had to have had something to do with his death. But she loved Jimmy Stewart's portrayal of him and just wouldn't buy it. He it shows you Hollywood in the person. deep state, shows you the power of Hollywood. If oh, you take, sure. you know, uh, somebody, Detective Mark, the gri <laughs> connecting dots, Bush and Bush, thank you. The Well, there's a lot of weird dots in this one. I got to tell you, this is an oldie, but a goldie. I haven't looked into the Lindbergh kidnapping since I was in college. And I was, you know, I started this week to get back and read the books. And I went, oh, screw, man. This is an unbelievably dot infested area. Oh, for sure. Oh, look at this. Del Rio McAllen. What? Thank you very much. A lot of people Coming like this channel, from. Eric, you know, with these stories. I don't understand what the. Um... There seems to be a lot of fervent people. Not a lot. It seems to be a set amount of fervent people who mm -hmm. really like us. And then there's the rest of the universe that couldn't care less and doesn't even know we exist. But the people who do really, really, <laughs> really like this. Well, there you go. So uh, well, let's celebrate the people who do. And now, what uh, about this? You were selling a, a stuffed dog or something last week? Uh, well, what I'm, I'm selling that? a stuffed dog every week, except when it's sold out like the, the stuffed bear, which is sold out. But this is Oswald, the Patsy dog. Right. He's not a. What, what happened to the bucket hat? The bucket hat looked like the best thing we've ever had. The bucket hat is still sitting here on the Look side. Well, Doesn't work well with headphones, hat. but Let me tell you that's it. That is your hat, Hunley. That is uh, your yeah. hat. <laughs> wow! Wow! So merch link down below. 
right all, kind, all kinds of stuff uh, available right let's see whatever ripaverse did do that humbly what is that who's ripaverse, ripaverse know what that do that humbly it must be another uh, channel guy ripaverse like universe i, I it, there are so many channel and then i i'll be like oh i never heard of my go and it's like two million subs i'm like Wow. No, no, I'm watching some of these quote unquote history channels and they are boring. You know, I mean, they don't, they don't do it. I mean, they tell you the story and then they go home. I mean, Hunley and I make up jokes. We laugh. We show you pictures. I threw a handle of vodka at the like button, severed its finger. <laughs> See, this is why I like Sarah. You know, she's got a sense of humor and she's drunk and naked, obviously, in somewhere in Texas. <laughs> you got to love this girl. Every week she shows up with another thing. Oh, my God. That is crazy. I mean, you don't like the dog either, Christine. I don't well, like that... the dog either. Uh, oh. Christine hates dogs. She loves cats. I guess so. Cat person. We don't have a stuffed cat, do we? Uh, no, we don't. We don't have a stuffed mouse either. Hmm, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Bob, snarky, there you go. Bob, there you go. That's great. For <laughs> snarky comment. I like that. It's like uh, fill in your own snark. Right. Oh, there's a blank. You five dollars. You fill in your blank snark. Sold. Sold. Well, everything I told you today, I think, will hold up under 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 scrutiny. I don't know um, what else I could tell you. That uh, the, you know, some of this stuff is so out there, and it, it was such a corrupt trial, but not corrupt in the sense of like some southern lynching trial. I mean, these guys meant what they were doing. You know what I mean? They believed in what they were doing. They were, you know, not railroading the guy, but they did railroad the guy. You know, in, in other words, they lied to the jury and they they did a lot of things. But, you know, as as the lawyer said in the case to the wife, the uh, Riley, he said there is real truth and there is legal truth. And he asked her early mm -hmm. on if she saw him with the money in the house when the guy gave her gave him the money, uh, uh, Fishy. When Fishy mm -hmm. gave him the money and she said, no, I didn't see it. He said, can you say you saw it? She said, I can't. Even if it meant your husband's life? And she goes, I can't. This was early on, like when he was just investigating the case. He sure. says, why can't you just say that you saw your husband? She said, I can't do it. I can't lie. I mean, it's really an incredible love story between the two of them. It really is insane. And the love story between Lindbergh and his wife, I don't know. How did you know, Mark? <laughs> oh, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> well, that was a guess. That was an educated guess. I'm sorry, Sarah. <laughs> well, I'm sorry to bust your bubble on that. Mike, uh, there's some sort of gypsy blood that I seem to see things differently than other people. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, you will not be here Friday. Right. I'm going to be with Barnes in Vegas and hopefully whatever we do in Vegas <laughs> stays in Vegas. I'm bringing some other celebrity actor with me, which I won't mention. And uh, so there's going to be three of us uh, doing stuff in Vegas Friday night. God help us help us get back um, uh, that weekend. That's all I could say. <laughs> it's just yeah, I don't know if I'm going to put up a, a repeat or, or what, but I'll see if I can come up with something for Friday. If not, maybe I'll do something on locals. I'm right now, sure. Tuesday w there was something we wanted to do on Tuesday. I forget. Did we discuss that next Tuesday? Uh, we were talking to David Ferry at one point, we were? But, but I don't know if that would be next. So why don't we? We'll put it out that we don't know what next Tuesday is. I don't know what next. All the more reason to subscribe because it's like a surprise. Let me tell you something. That show about what that we just did um, uh, about the prison, Mark in jail, mm -hmm. has had ten thousand viewers already. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good for something that watch just, just about me in prison. Exactly. I mean, yeah, just wanted to point that it's out. A, it was, was a fulfilled wish. I was surprised. <laughs> <laughs> the numbers were, surprised me. I, I'm always a doubting Thomas about any of this crap. I don't believe any of this is real. But Hunley convinces me that it's real and somehow money's involved. I don't really know how that works. But Hunley knows, and that's all that matters. So that's take right. it from Hunley. And Hunley has a PayPal, too. So oh, yeah. everybody feel free to listen. Every <laughs> mind goes to books. Think about books, how valuable they are in a culture that keeps deplatforming people and doing away with websites. Digital doesn't cut it. Out. Digital scares me now. Only. You know what I mean? Those Kindle books scares me. I have a feeling it could be wiped out in a second. That whole movement, by the way, of uh, going with electronic books in public libraries has kind of disappeared. Remember, mm. they were going to convert all this is about five or six years ago. Mm. It, was a, it was controversial uh, even at the time. Right. But I'm saying it's died. It's died. Yeah. 
Yeah, it, well, it, it was a trial balloon, Eric. Actually, physical book sales have gone up. Oh my! Oh my! So it, it's uh, Kindle you know is you know fantastic why? for Fahrenheit four fifty one. I got to memorize that entire Walker book and meet these other people down by the railroad track, <laughs> and we're all going to walk around reciting each of our books. That one thousand two hundred fifteen page book is going to be my name. That's the one I'm going to be down there reciting that book out loud. Because of you, mm -hmm. PayPal people. That's why. You've allowed me to become that book. Wouldn't that be great if everybody just memorized one book and we all met like Fahrenheit 451? It may come down to that. It may come down to that. For well, isn't people. that what the Iliad and the Odyssey technically were? Yeah. They would have one book memorized and yeah. swapped yeah. a tail. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to memorize one of these books. Somebody's going to memorize the entire Warren Commission, all 26 volumes. He's just going to walk around. His name is Warren. He's going, God dude, help us. Here's Warren. He knows. Wasn't it. that Garrison? In a, in a way, it was Garrison. Also, Mark <laughs> Lane did. Mark Lane did it, and so did Mort Saul. Mort Saul, when he appeared, he had all the volumes in back of him. Mort so, Saul did the same thing. So you all. know, you can name the three people who actually read the damn report. At least three. I, I did. I have not. I have not. I couldn't afford to get all twenty six volumes. My mother wouldn't let me even go out on a Friday night and get the, the Sunday New York Times on, on Saturday night, rather, because she thought I would steal the money, which happened on occasion. All right. Well, we got uh, one more in here from probably, oh, not probably not. Dude, I saw him. He was on with the Vivian Barnes Sunday night. Remember yeah. the Princess Bride? Back in my day, television was called Books. Wow. That's interesting. Way to go, Posh. I forgot about that. Good wow. A lot of these people, I see them on the other channel. You know, um, Cheating on us. Cheating on us? <laughs> oh, I mean, they're donating money to people who don't need any any support. They don't need any support. We do. Oh, you think Veeb and Barnes needs your five dollars? Folks, there, it's, it's, it's great talking to you. So <laughs> we'll see you next Tuesday. <laughs>